I need you. I need you all the time. I need you so much. I'm going to be intentional about showing you I need you. What kind of character is produced by that kind of attitude? We're going to look at that this morning. We're going to look at the, what's produced when someone decides to be poor in spirit and to be empty-handed in their relationship with the Lord. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah 53. If you do not have a physical Bible, don't worry. I have slides for you. Title this morning is Poor in Spirit, a Spirit of Suffering. A Spirit of Suffering. And as you guys turn there, obviously we're in Isaiah. This is one of the cornerstone prophecies that would mark the coming of the Messiah. The, the Jewish people were for years would say, man, the Messiah, the chosen one, this is what he's going to look like. And it's interesting that many of them decide to reject Jesus. Even though, like, ah, uh, Jesus looks like this guy. We read about in Isaiah 53, but it's so powerful because we see really the essence of who Jesus was. And he was, uh, as many um, have called this verse, uh, this prophecy, he really was the suffering servant. Amen? So let's, 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 let's see what we can draw out of this prophecy about Jesus and how he was poor in spirit. Isaiah 53, verse 1. It says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by all mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. You know, the first aspect of a spirit of suffering that we have to, in one sense, choose to recognize is that emotional suffering is a part of that spirit. We don't like to emotionally suffer, but what we see here is a man who emotionally suffers. We read in 2 Corinthians 8 this past Wednesday, right, about how Jesus chose to be poor so that we could become rich. This man lived in eternity. He was at the beginning of time. He is the creator. He's the almighty. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And yet he chose to live as a man in a form that was despised by all men. There's much to draw out here, but to me that stands out. He was despised and rejected by mankind, by man in general. It'd be one thing to be despised, it's another to be rejected, but by everybody. He left heaven to live in an earthly body and to try and save humanity, only for humanity to think of him as nothing. Only to be despised by the very people he wanted to love. Let's put ourselves in the shoes here. Let's think of all the times you felt rejected. Think of all the times you felt less than. The times you felt unloved. The times you felt, man, does anyone care about me? The times you felt abandoned. The times you felt not enough. The times you felt different from everyone else. The times you felt you didn't measure up. Times you felt you'd never measure up no matter how hard you tried. You'd always be just a little bit below what you'd hope people would see in you. Imagine that feeling and multiply that by all of mankind for all of eternity. And you start to get an idea of the kind of emotional suffering Jesus decided to endure for you and I. That's the kind of emotional pain he chose to take on. But when we're poor in spirit, like Jesus was, when we can come to God like he did, empty-handed and with no expectations, no agendas, no prerogatives, except to be close to our Father like Jesus did, then we, like Jesus, we can also endure 
more emotional suffering than you and I think we ever could. How many times have we chose to be faithless, to give in to fear? Maybe God puts some challenging things on your hearts. Hey, man, go, go share your faith with that person. Go be generous towards these people. Open up your home. Be hospitable. You're like, ah, ooh. And I think deep down inside, oh, for me, there's subconscious thoughts. Of, I've been rejected before. Do I want to keep putting myself out there? And it's challenging sometimes. The Bible says what this, what this shows us is that we can be stronger emotionally, more fortified in this area than we ever think we can because Jesus fought this way. Jesus had no agenda. He had no, you know, he wanted to be loved, but he had no burning desire to be liked or to have a social status about him. He was not a politician. He did not live for approval ratings. Jesus was a man who simply wanted to walk with his father, and he wanted to walk with the people that wanted to walk with him. When we are poor in spirit, we can endure the poorest of emotional states and still serve the Lord wholeheartedly. Jesus was okay with not being socially accepted or liked. Jesus was okay with being misunderstood or looked down on. Jesus was okay with not being considered a success. Jesus was okay with having it all in heaven and having nothing here on earth. Jesus was okay with his own family, his mother and younger brothers, thinking he was crazy. They tried to basically take him to the crazy house in the middle of his sermon. Jesus was okay with never marrying, with never having biological or adopted children. We, of course, know that Christians are technically part of the bride of Christ as the church, that he married the bride of Christ, right? And that Christians are also the children of God, and he has descendants, but I think you guys get what I'm saying. Jesus gave up a lot. At age 33, the prime of someone's life, he had enough wisdom to have plenty of ways to navigate the world, and his whole life yet in front of him. And he said, now I will give it all up. Imagine that. Imagine being 33. The best is yet to come. In one sense, you've hit the peak of your, maybe, career. People are wondering, man, Jesus, why don't you just proclaim the kingdom? You can defeat Rome. You can do it all yourself. Just do it now, Lord. Bring the kingdom now. Jesus goes, yes, I'm going to show you what this kingdom is built on. And I'm going to die because that's what this kingdom is about. Jesus was okay with the emotional suffering that came with being the Messiah. The Bible says that he lived a life that was familiar with pain. He was called a man of suffering or a man of sorrows as we sang about before communion. This man's life was defined by sorrow. He was the man of sorrows. And he was okay with it because he loved us. Are we okay with the emotional suffering that has to come with following the Messiah? Are we okay with being rejected by others because of our love for Jesus? Are we okay with not getting the promotion or the raise or the internship or the spouse or the house? Because who we value is not the same as what everyone else values. When we are poor in spirit, like Jesus was, we understand that emotional suffering is the cost of loving people the way Jesus loved people. People, were, will, people will hurt you if you are close to them. There's no way. You are opening yourself up. The cross, I heard uh, our brother Will Archer taught this. He said the cross is a, the, the least defensive stance you can take. And you're literally going to someone like this. Like, 
You're opening yourself up. You are going to get hurt. By Christians and non-Christians, everyone's going to hurt you. Jesus was hurt by one of his 12. And we know how often the other 11 annoyed him. Yeah. <laughs> and we know they hurt him too, in all seriousness, right? But on a, so this is about loving people, but on a deeper level, even when it's not about other people being hateful or unmerciful, I hope you understand that in this life, Jesus once again said, we're just going to have trouble. Are we okay with going through pain simply because we love Jesus and we are willing to feel an ounce of what he may have felt? When we signed up for this, we said, I want to be like Jesus. Jesus goes, amen. I want you to feel what I felt. There's no way you can be like me if you don't feel what I felt. Are we okay with feeling unloved or unwanted, with feeling unsuccessful, uncomfortable, or unimportant? Because we are making the appropriate choices. We are prioritizing kingdom matters. And therefore, the world may reject us. Not just because we want others to see God through our choices and our perseverance, but simply because we want to follow the Lord. Is feeling what Jesus felt, is experiencing what he experienced, is walking the path he walked, is taking the posture that he took, is it truly enough for you and I? If we can say yes to this question, we will not only be able to endure emotional suffering, but I believe we will become more like the Lord, and we can endure even more, like what he endured. Let's keep reading chapter 53, verse 4, amen? It says, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has, has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? No one stood up for Jesus. For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. We see that after Jesus endured emotional suffering, he then took on the cross and endured physical suffering. This passage foreshadows the crucifixion in a way where we see that Jesus, this was, like, this was not some mindless robot that went through this, right? That whole process, he felt every ounce a physical pain. We see words here that stick out. Afflicted. Afflicted. It says a lot. Pierced. Crushed. We see the word slaughter. These are visceral words. These are words you can feel. The pain Jesus experienced, to me when I read this, it leaps off the page. I feel the pain when I read this prophecy. The world did this man dirty all because of the dirt we've done. Or the dirt we think about. The dirt we feel and, and we choose to entertain and, and keep living in. And in this prophecy, we feel the intense physical suffering he went through for you and I as a result. But what I love is, you know, when you're willing to emotionally suffer for someone, 
this passage teaches us that you're more than likely to physically suffer for someone. When you love someone, you'll push yourself. When you love something, you will chase it even beyond your physical limitations. Jesus was poor in spirit, right? And a man who's poor in spirit does not consider his life so important that he is unwilling to give it up for the sake of someone else. A man or woman who's poor in spirit does not consider their comfort so crucial that they are unwilling to endure tangible pain so that the power of God can be seen through their pain. When we are close to God and poor in spirit and letting God revive our spirits, I believe any of us here can endure more than we ever thought we could endure physically so that the gospel can be preached. You know, a lot of you guys know our, me and Melissa's story when we lost our first daughter, you know, and, and, and praise God, the church there in Springfield, you know, they gave us, they, 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 they wanted to give us a lot of time off, but they said, hey, take a couple of weeks. But for us, we were just grateful to be around the body. And I thought, man, I can't believe we're, you know, we took some time off, but I was like, I want to be around my family. I need to be around them right now. I need to be preaching the word. I need to be out here still sharing my faith. If you would have told me when I was 19 years old, when I became a Christian, that that's how I would have responded if something like that happened to me, I would have told you you were crazy. But that's the spirit of the living God. It changes a man or a woman in ways you can't understand. And if you choose to suffer like Jesus, you will grow like Jesus, and you will overcome like Jesus. I'm grateful for our family here. We got some examples of tough people who I see the toughness of Jesus, a willingness to endure physical pain. You know, I asked you guys to pray earlier for Heather, right, New, our newest sister in Christ. She's got migraines today, but she came to her first congregational midweek this past week, and she brought her three daughters with her, right? One of them's a baby, right? But, it, you know, they, they, she got, she got, she's got littles, and as soon as they parked, one of them, Willow, literally lost one of her teeth. And, of course, the mouth is just bleeding profusely. It's like... As soon as they part, <laughs> oh, mom, I lost my tooth. <laughs> Here it goes, right? And, you know, the girls, right, maybe we should go home. Like, like Willow's tooth is bleeding, right? It's going all over the place. And Heather goes, I got you guys out here. We're going to church. <laughs> <laughs> we made it this far. We're staying here. <laughs> Everybody was physically suffering, right? But Heather is teaching her kids, hey, sometimes this is what it takes to be close to God. You gotta fight through things. Yeah. You gotta physically suffer if you're gonna be close. Because that's what the Lord did. He physically suffered. Yeah. Sometimes we have to undergo a little physical suffering for Jesus to understand how much suffering Jesus actually went through for us. And I respect her toughness. I know it's gonna help her daughters understand the toughness of Jesus. Yeah. You know, especially my, you know, her her husband, Tyler, I've known for five years now. And uh, we met, you know, playing basketball with a lot of you guys remember Marcus Jackson. And uh, we've been doing Bible studies lately together, and he's been taking on the challenge of reading his Bible every day. But he just started Fire Academy, so pray for him, right? Which you can imagine, there's physical suffering that goes with that. Discomfort is probably going on in his life right now. So we get there on Thursday night, and he looks like, you know, Tyler's pretty jovial. I'm like, this is not the same Tyler I usually know. Like, he's just kind of like, he's playing with the slinky, it's like this. And I'm just like, oh, this guy's tired. We're hanging out, we're, we're just hanging, and, and his alarm rings on his phone at 9 p.m. He's like, oh, that means I need to read my Bible. <laughs> I'm like, oh, bro, amen. It's, it's, you look tired. Before he left, he's like, it's, uh, I should probably read my Bible now, <laughs> right? I'm like, bro, amen. That's a desire to see God even through physical discomfort like Fire Academy all day. I was proud of my friend. This guy's learning to see God, even when it's physically challenging. Sometimes that's what it takes to not just see God, but to be like God, to learn to walk like Jesus, to learn to think like Jesus. Speaking of physically challenging, right, there's the other Tyler, who's a friend of mine, Tyler East, right? The guy's up here. He preached with a slip disc for our men a few weeks ago. The man preached with a slip disc. That's, that's tough. I, that's, I, I was, I, like, that's physical suffering, but that's how Jesus rolled. I said, bro, you don't have to do this. 
okay? Chris got it. Chris got the other half. I can pitch in. I can, whatever, we'll make it happen. That man said, hey, man, I got this. He said, out of my way, Janice. I'm preaching the word tonight, right? <laughs> and I said, bro, amen. Go for it. Lay it out. Because, you know, the Lord put something on his heart, and he wanted to get after it. Think about Miss Teresa driving to Columbia all the way from Moberly with her grandbaby sometimes. She brings all them granddaughters with her. If we got church on Wednesday night, she'll find a way to stay the night here in Columbia if she has to. So she doesn't have to risk driving all the way back in the dark back to Moberly. I'm like, that's tough. You bring all your grandbabies with your church, and then, you know, you, you don't have to drive all the way from Moberly, but you do. And you figure out a way so that you don't put yourself in physical harm. That's close. That's being close to Jesus. That's being like Jesus. That's saying there's no physical discomfort that's going to stop me from doing what I got to do. Think about Dave and Sandy Eppinger, right? I know they've been recovering from illness, so they haven't been here physically lately. But I hopefully, I know they're probably listening to this or watching this. And I'm like, I need, you, I need them to know that we see them walking up front to church every Sunday. We see them making that walk. It matters to us. It matters to me. And most of all, it matters to God. What are the physical challenges that Jesus is allowing you to face? So that you can deeper understand how much he loves you. Maybe it's, it's as simple as the discomfort of getting up and reading your Bible and praying early in the morning. Sometimes that's about as uncomfortable as it's going to get for us. And let's be honest, that's pretty uncomfortable. The alarm hits, nah, nah, it just sounds like it's blaring. You're like, this sounds like just, just sirens right now. I know it's a phone, but it feels like a fire drill going on. And you're like, ah, you know what, Jesus, ah, I'm good. I'm good. What are, you, what are we willing to endure for the sake of the Lord? Maybe it's as simple as I'm going to go to bed a little bit earlier and stay off my phone a little bit. Maybe that's the suffering we need to endure. Okay, well, if I'm going to have a hard time getting up, I need to just get to bed. Oh, Lord, I got to get to bed a little bit earlier. Oh, this is so hard. If that's where we're at, that's where we're at. We should probably do it. Amen. amen. Trust me, I've been there. It's nice to zone out. It's nice. The, the, the es escapes are nice. We learn about quadrant four living, right? Quadrant four are those things are like, you know, this is a time waster, but it feels so good, you know? And it's hard, but that's how we're going to, Jesus gave up way more than that for us, guys. Maybe it's as simple as that. Maybe it's as complicated as having a family devotional with your little ones or your teens or whoever, even though you've been tired and you still need to clean dishes after dinner. You don't want to have a semi-complicated talk with anybody, let alone with multiple kids and how your highs and your lows and who knows what can of worms that could open up. Hey, what was the best part of your day, little Jimmy? What was the worst part of your day? Oh, no, here we go. Not equipped to handle this. I'm dead tired. Maybe it's as complicated as that. I can see why you would not want to face that. Maybe it's literally enduring a physical ailment day after day and still deciding to come to church and to still ask people if they want to sit down and study the Bible with you, even though you're tired or you're hurting. Regardless of what we endure, the question is, will you endure it? Will you accept the pain? I'm not saying, like, you know, just kill yourself. But there's, we know we can, we have, when we have a little extra to push. Will we accept the pain, the discomfort, because of the pain that Jesus endured for us? This isn't a matter of responding out of guilt, okay? Because that's not what Jesus wants. What Jesus wants is for us to be inspired by his passion. He wants us to be moved by his pain to the point where we move our own bodies, even when pain or discomfort is there. Will you let Jesus move you to do whatever you can? Doesn't have to be a lot, but whatever you can to endure what you need to endure to advance his gospel. Because if we do, we see that Jesus himself saw something powerful come from his own suffering. Amen? We can finish up chapter 53, verse 10, and we got a baptism, so I'm going to wrap this up. 53, verse 10 says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, 
and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand after he has suffered. Keyword, after he has suffered. He will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he poured his, out, out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So there's emotional suffering, there's physical suffering, finally there's fruit from suffering. There's the fruit of suffering. Verse 11 to me is the, zenith, is the zenith of this passage. It says, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. If you have an NIV version, you can read at the bottom, you can translate this verse, light of life, with he will see the fruit of his suffering and be satisfied. The suffering Jesus endured bore all kinds of fruit. And we know in the context of this, it's in the form of souls being saved. To this day, Jesus' suffering bears fruit. To this day, Jesus is in heaven, satisfied with what he had to endure because he sees what it produced in you and I. The fruit of Jesus' suffering the changed souls who became Christians, it satisfied him. The Hebrew word for satisfied here communicates a sense of being full or sated. And can even be translated in other uh, translations of the Bible, this, this word is, can be translated to having in excess or in abundance. Wouldn't we all like that to have an excess of things? It'd be nice. Like, oh, I, got, I got way too much of this. Sometimes, when, you know, if you, got, you try and get rid of stuff, sure, it's bad. But oftentimes, it'd be nice to live in abundance. Here's what we got to remember. Jesus, who lived a life that was poor in spirit, who emptied himself completely for others in a dramatic turn of events, actually ends up being totally filled and satisfied in the end. Isn't that how God always works? This is how we always, the last shall be first. The humble shall be lifted up. Those who suffer will be satisfied. Suffering for the Lord will always bear fruit. Jesus ultimately was satisfied because his life impacted not just our lives here on earth, but our eternities. Forever. And then you look at who he was. He was poor in spirit. And yet he lived the fullest life. Because he filled up the lives of other people. His life, his sacrifice, his suffering, it bore fruit. And therefore, he was a full man. He was an abundant man. It makes sense, therefore, that Jesus said, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Because the kingdom of heaven, it's a way of life. It's about God's love being experienced by as many people as possible. Someone who is poor in spirit and is willing to suffer emotionally and physically for others, those will be the souls who will get the kingdom. They will inherit the kingdom of God. Those will be the souls who see God's love change people. Those will be the souls whose own lives will be changed by God's love, and those will be the souls who will be satisfied. God wants to satisfy us, guys. He wants us to be full. He wants us to experience fruit. This morning, do we believe that our suffering will bear fruit? Do we believe that we are poor in spirit? We the kingdom is ours. Do we believe that, honestly believe that being a part of God, changing lives, changing hearts, will fill us in ways and is way better than a house full of stuff 
or a bank account full of money ever could be? What in your life do you think can fill you up more than living the kingdom life? Do we believe that living in the kingdom of Jesus is more fulfilling than building up our own kingdoms? I want us to think about these things. You know, we're going to see someone inherit the kingdom of heaven here in a second. We're going to have one more song. But as we do, let's remember, it starts with emotional suffering. A spirit of suffering starts with being willing to be looked down on, be less than, to, to, to not feel like we're getting what we deserve, to not get what we feel like we're entitled to. And then it carries over to being willing to physically suffer, to push ourselves when we normally would not, to, to go in our comfort zones and even feel some pain to, to see who God is. And all of this, we have to trust that we will experience fruit, that we'll experience goodness, we'll experience true joy. Let's remember these things this morning. And let's pray for God to help us be truly poor in spirit. Amen? Amen. Love you guys. Thank you. Sorry, did I say that all that? Uh, Janice, thank you. Um, you know what's... Uh, Jesus is uh, uh, inspiring, is he not? I mean, that's, that was a communion right there. We had communion, then we had another communion. Um, I do love Jesus. I love his character. I love his heart. I love uh, the way he is so inspiring. And I think that for me, what really is convicting is this, the, the mentality of what feels right is directly contrary to this idea of being poor in spirit, you know? And we see Jesus, we look at Jesus, and it's like, man, so many things about him are just amazingly inspiring, motivating, and encouraging. And you do see that it's like, what, what, put your finger on what was that he was just empty-handed. God, I need you only. That's what I need. And so there's times where it's like, hey, well, that decision didn't seem like I would make that decision because that didn't feel right or didn't, it doesn't feel the best or that's not comfortable, you know. Um, but that's, that's what struck me. I'm just convicted that in my life, comfortability is a significant factor of decisions of what I make, right, you know, um, what time I get out of my bed is a decision I make based on how I want to be comfort, you know, um, but for me, you know, my job is pretty flexible with its hours, I'm salary and I have that opportunity, and I do right, I do, you know, I work hard my job, but it does afford me to not have to be up so early, I hear some of you guys get up so early, I'm like, man, that's crazy, <laughs> that's nuts, so I don't do it. But then it's like, okay, therefore that means I put at risk having quality time with God that day. Is that worth that? You know? So I'm just really convicted. Hey, I need to get up a little earlier so I can get that quality time first thing, make sure not at risk. That's going to happen. Something else may suffer, but not my time with God. And so I'm just grateful for that. Thank you for the challenge this morning. I was going to say a quick prayer. We'll last song in a baptism, right? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much uh, for your son. Jesus, you are amazingly inspiring. I just I love your heart. I love that you paved the way. You showed us how to live, uh, not for comfort, not for our own what's best for us, but truly just be empty-handed and really receive from God all that we need. And it's so satisfying, so satisfying to see that change, to be able to be something greater than us, but more like Jesus. So thank you for that sacrifice. Thank you for this lesson today. And thank you that today we will we'll witness another soul making that decision. We love you, Father, through your son to pray. Amen.